The following presentation is brought to you by Discovery Education, leading the world of digital and video learning. Discovery Education, connect to a world of learning. Australia's food and traditions are an exotic mix of old and new. In bustling cities, cosmopolitan traditions reveal the nation's history. Once, new Australians followed only British rituals established by the first convict settlers in 1788. But traditional English fare has now been upstaged by adventurous dishes from Asia, the Middle East, and beyond. A legacy of the fact that one in four Australians is born overseas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Australia is a nation of immigrants that has something for everyone. But this international cuisine is in contrast to what you would find in Australia's red center. Here, there is a deep reverence for a land that has provided for at least 40,000 years. We don't have to farm the land at all because everything's there that we ever needed. Arthur Turtle Tamwoy prepares to cook a kangaroo the traditional way. It is a process steeped in ritual. We've been doing this for uh, thousands and thousands of years. Nothing's really changed, so we keep our culture strong. Aboriginal Australians believe kangaroos are life-giving spirits. Only men are allowed to hunt and prepare them, tasks considered men's business. It is a very sacred process. You get in big trouble if you don't do it the right way. The meat is low in fat and high in protein. It's a special meal. It's a tradition for us, kangaroo meat. A lot of us would rather eat kangaroo than have a T-bone steak. 300 miles south at Anna Creek, other Australians enjoy the closest thing to a national dish, a barbecue. It is a ritual that straddles old and new, an outdoor feast in one of the world's most cosmopolitan countries. On a continent the size of Europe, that has just one-thirtieth of its population, is a force that unites Australia, and even defines the national character. It is sports. It starts shortly after birth. Children are encouraged to bat, kick, tackle, and throw. In one game, Australians will always win. It's played or understood by no one else. Australian rules football was invented here, so cricket players could keep fit in the off-season. Now it stands as the country's most popular spectator sport. Hand in hand with sport is Australia's other favorite pastime, horse racing. Never mind that some race meets are hundreds of miles from the nearest city. The outback town of Birdsville is so isolated that many choose to fly in and set up camp at the airstrip. I love the bush, but I don't think I could actually live out here myself, being a city boy. Shane Patton and his city friends have flown all day to the Birdsville races. In Australian tradition, the discomforts are celebrated. Isolation, heat, and dust storms. See if you can meet a nice cowgirl. Red lights are on. 
Come on, you good thing. And Shalopo inside the 200 from Jagger. Lord Tires are down the outside and Meteor Appeal is squeezing through. Lord Tires are on the outside. Winning is important to Australians. But never at the expense of having fun. Australians try not to take themselves too seriously, except maybe when it comes to sports. Australia is not one nation, but many. Here, 140 nationalities live side by side. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Mr. Hung Lee. Among them is Vietnamese comedian Hung Lee. This woman, right, they deported her because she stacked her car. And I'm thinking, man, they're deporting bad Asian drivers now. So I thought, man, I'm next. I've been here 30 years now, and I reckon I've only just started to be Australian. Hung and his family fled here during the Vietnam War. He's part of the changing face of Australia, a migration to this land that began thousands of years before. I left the canoe there, and they're calling that to you. Australia's first settlers are believed to have come from Asia. Until European colonization, there were more than 400 Aboriginal tribes, or nations. They survived here for more than 40,000 years. Until the arrival of the British in 1788. From the first 1500 settlers, half of whom were convicts, a new Australia was born. They found paradise and then sent all the convicts here. You know, it's paradise. You know. Other nationalities followed. First from China in a gold rush rivaling Californians. Then European refugees at the end of the Second World War. During the 1970s, more refugees arrived from Asia and the Middle East. In all, six million people have immigrated to Australia in the last 60 years. Half a million fleeing trouble. It's tempting to believe that Australia has plenty of room for more people. It's as large an area as the United States, but has only about 7% of the population. The nearest town could be 600 miles away, and an Australian will tell you, it's just down the road. In truth, the land is too poor and dry to support a large population, forcing most people to live in Australia's coastal cities. It makes the population one of the most urbanized on Earth. Aborigines may hold the key to living in this unforgiving land. But after 200 years, they account for less than 3% of the population. Australia is different because it's made up of so many different nationalities and people hold on to their cultures. He's going away, kids. Australians are born travelers. The vastness of the world's biggest island demands it. See, see you Sunday? Yeah. Okay. Each Sunday. week, trucker Shane Franklin leaves his children and wife, Leanne. Can you give daddy hugs? Oh, good girl. He sees his family just five days every month. Hardest part, being on your own without him most of the time. And the kids miss him. Don't get to do much together, really. See you, kids. Bye bye. It's the life I've chosen, so I've got to, got to deal with it now. And she's accepted it. She's a good woman. Couldn't ask for any more. See you, kids. Shane Franklin has the world's loneliest job. He pilots a 62-wheel, three-trailer road train through the vast emptiness of Australia. Sometimes it's a real long, long time between stops, between roadhouses or whatever, and it's just basically nothing. You can't see nothing for miles. 
The nation is two and a half thousand miles wide, surrounded by a coastline longer than the planet's circumference. The silent void in between is Shane Franklin's traveling companion for 180,000 miles every year. Of course I worry about him, yeah, all the time. But I know he's, he knows what he's doing. And, and all the time we've been together, he hasn't had an accident. Cross fingers, it'll stay that way. Living in Australia has always meant coping with long distances. Australia's first transport technology came from the Middle East, the camel. Only this animal could survive the tyranny of the desert. Now, outback properties rely on light aircraft, as common as pickup trucks. A remote continent on the bottom of the world depends on the lifeline of shipping and long-haul air travel. Distance helps define the Aussie character. It's an accepted part of life in this wide brown land. He wouldn't do anything else. I wouldn't ask him to do anything else. Trucking is his life. It's in the blood, I guess. Australia was once criticized as a lucky country run by second-rate people who share its luck. Most Australians dismiss the slur, but agree they are lucky. Beneath the nation's prehistoric soil is a treasure trove of wealth. If you drive those tracks, like 22, you've warmed here, yeah. As you can see, it's quite easy. Stacey Monroe works in Australia's biggest gold mine, known as the Super Pit. Super Pit is about four kilometres long, a kilometre wide and about 380 metres deep. We haul out about 89 million tonnes of dirt a year. The rig she drives is as large as a house. It's like getting in the car, I guess, because you drive your car every day. I drive these trucks every day. Automatic retarder going down and you've got cruise control coming up the ramp. That's really easy. Gold here is extracted from tiny particles embedded in the rock. Just reversing now into the shell. That's the uh, dirt getting loaded into the back of the shell. We just had 59 tonne put on us. Gold. Hopefully, gold. In every load of high grade that we get, you probably get the size of a golf ball is how much gold will be in that whole tray of dirt. Australia is the third largest miner of gold. But that's not all. The country is also the world's single largest producer of iron ore, lead, alumina, and industrial diamonds. It is the second largest producer of uranium, fourth largest of silver, and fifth largest miner of coal. Also hidden beneath the dry interior are 95% of the world's opals. All this wealth just by digging. They make a lot of money and get a lot of gold. Not all Australia's riches lie entombed in the earth. Although 70% of the land is semi-arid or desert, Australia is the world's largest exporter of beef. One million sheep supply two-thirds of the global wool market. Agricultural exports earn more than one billion dollars a week. And tourism earns another 18 billion dollars annually. Australia is the lucky country. For thousands of years, the bottom of the world hid a secret. An animal so bizarre, news of its discovery was first thought to be a hoax. It wasn't until 1797 that humans first set eyes on the platypus, an 
extraordinary animal that looks like a combination of mammal and duck. The platypus is just one unique inhabitant of the evolutionary test lab that is Australia. When Australia broke away from the ancient supercontinent Gondwana about 130 million years ago, the island was left to drift alone. For millions of years, life here was left undisturbed by visiting species. The kangaroo is perhaps the most recognizable. It evolved to hop because the land is vast and dry. Although it looks energetic, it actually conserves energy by hopping. With summer temperatures over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, conserving energy is the key to survival here. The koala does this in its own unique way. An animal's brain uses more energy than any other organ. The koala's solution is to cut energy costs with a smaller model. Its brain takes up just 60% of the space in its skull, a unique adaptation in the mammal kingdom. Other creatures let toxins fight for them. Australia has more venomous snakes than non-poisonous ones. In fact, the country is a menagerie of deadly animals. The funnel web spider, the redback spider, the blue ringed octopus, sharks, saltwater crocodiles, and even the puzzling platypus with poisonous spurs on its hind legs. Although 70% of the country is semi-arid or desert, small pockets of wetlands and rainforests flourish in the tropical north. Australia's forests and woodlands contain more plant species than all of Europe. The country's natural bounty even flows offshore. The Great Barrier Reef is the world's largest and most complex reef system. The size of Japan, this underwater oasis contains more than 1,500 species of fish and 350 species of coral. Of the 13 million species found on the planet, 1 million, or 7%, live in Australia. It's a floating ark at the bottom of the world. Placed in the middle of a tectonic plate, Australia has been spared the relatively recent violence of volcanoes and continental collisions. It is the oldest and flattest land on Earth. Australia is also the world's driest inhabited continent. Water means the difference between life and death. Half the continent is home to less than 1% of the population. Among them are sheep farmers Carol and Lindsay Godfrey. We now use a helicopter because we are having an extremely difficult time getting employees to come and work for us. The couple runs their sprawling sheep station themselves. I like to think I'm the boss, but um, I very much doubt that. I do all the, the financial management and the strategic planning. Carol pretty much looks after the everyday stock issues. Like many Australian farmers, their livelihood depends on regular rainfall. But the weather here is at the mercy of a meteorological mayhem. It's a phenomenon created thousands of miles away across the Pacific. Known as El Nino, fluctuations in ocean temperature mean that Australia faces unforgiving cycles of droughts and floods. When you have a good season and things are good, it's the best place on earth. But the last three or four years has been quite difficult. We've had a lot of tough times, but we're still confident that we'll come out the other end all right and the, the climate cycles will spin around for us. So we're, we're absolute optimists, so we wouldn't be here. Fortunately, many Australian farmers have a helping hand. The secret to outback life is a vast underground aquifer known as the Great Artesian Basin. For two million years, the basin has been collecting water, enough to fill 20 billion Olympic swimming pools. I'm just going up to check the middle plank of wood. It's not quite square with the rod going through it, so I just want to go up and check it. 
should be right. Water lies under one fifth of the continent. See, I like flood. Windmills are a constant reminder of the outback's hidden lifeline. To come up here and see it all full and working, it's a huge relief. In a parched, flat land, always threatened by distant and deadly weather, this life-giving liquid reaches back from Australia's prehistoric past. It's liquid gold out here. Without the Artesian Basin, a lot of this country would be useless. To Australian Aborigines, the Earth is an ancient gift. In a time called the Dreaming, ancestor spirits bequeath the land to humans. To this day, Aborigines continue to pay homage to their inheritance through art, stories, dance, ceremony, and song. We dance to pay respect to the stories, to be a part of that story, to be in touch with Mother Nature. Ceremonies are often secret and separated between men's business and women's business. It is almost impossible for outsiders to know these secrets, but they are the foundation of more than 300 different tribal nations that make up Australia's Aboriginal population today. At the center of Aboriginal music is the didgeridoo. And to a lot of people, it's just a piece of wood. But um, a lot of people don't realize that it's one of the most ancient instruments in the world. Made from a hollowed out tree branch, the instrument is very hard to play. But Arthur Turtle Tamoy has mastered it. Now, how do you keep that wind going? Pull that wind, pull it, got to fill that mouth up, and when you blow through, you get a little bit through the nose, and there's the pressure in the mouth. Playing requires good air control between the nose and mouth called circular breathing. The didgeridoo originated in northeastern Australia. Its haunting sound is one of the most identifiable features of Aboriginal culture. But to Aborigines like Turtle, the didgeridoo is more than a musical instrument. It's a portal connecting their land and their spirits. The sound of our planet spinning is the same sound as the didgeridoo being played. Aboriginal respect in connection with music, ceremony, and land has sustained one of the world's oldest surviving cultures. <laughs> 